this picture going back and forth here, but uh, get my projector to, oh, the pointer to work. Still getting used to this pointer. There we go. Um, our dog, we, we adopted this dog two years ago after she showed up at our, at our door one night and was the most fearful thing I'd ever seen. And as we, uh, two weeks later, we brought her home from SBCA and she has been the most grateful thing I've ever seen. Um, she is attached to me, so whenever I come home, she howls and makes all sorts of a fuss. Some, some of it, I think, is excited that I'm home. Some of it is uh, fussing me out for leaving <laughs> without her. Um, but we have this thing where we, I'll run to the couch, and she runs, leaps up onto the couch, and just buries her head in my lap. For my dog, heaven is being with her master. And as we think about heaven, uh, when, we, when we think about what heaven is, oops, what does heaven mean to you? What do you envision? Now, I, I gotta say, I really appreciate, I think this is awesome, the clouds, the way they have these suspended here. From where you are, you, you don't even, they just seem to be floating there, don't they? They did a great job with this. I want to I take issue sometimes, though, in our concept of heaven, I think we, may, we have made heaven sterile when we think of heaven as just sitting on clouds and playing harps. I, I think we may be doing some of that, but I think heaven is so much more. But when we think about heaven, we oftentimes focus on freedom from pain, from suffering, from depression, from anxiety, from fear, from poverty. We think of all these things and um, we look forward to the day where we can be in a world where there is no suffering, death, or pain, or grief. And that is a real part of heaven. Revelation 20 makes that clear. Sometimes we look forward to being free from responsibility. Oh, I can just relax and just sit on a cloud all day and enjoy life for eternity. But I, I want us to think about something. When, when the Bible says that um, we will sit with Christ on thrones, we will rule with him as kings and priests, have you ever wondered if we're all ruling as kings and, and priests, who are we ruling over? How does that work? Well, as I've looked up at the sky and realized how vast the universe is, and here you can only see just our little island called the Milky Way Galaxy, which I, we venture to guess is somewhere around 200 billion stars. And scientists now estimate that there are 10 times as many galaxies as there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Two trillion galaxies times an average of 200 billion stars. And we're finding out as we've been searching over the last 10, 15 years that there are, um, it seems like most every star has planets. We found at least 4,000 what we call exoplanets outside of our solar system in the last in the last 10 or 15 years. When we look at how God created everything, his pattern of creation, we have to stop and realize that his pattern of creation in, Rev in Genesis 1 was to, to make a space and then fill it a few days later. Should it surprise us if God has filled the universe with other intelligent races? We know of angels. Job chapter 1 alludes to the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And if you really think through this out, this isn't, these aren't humans, these aren't people on earth, because where was, why wasn't Job included? He was the most righteous man in the East. The implication that these are other, the heads of other inhabited worlds out there. So let's just stop and think for a moment. If we have just, in the universe, if there is just one intelligent race per galaxy, we're looking at two trillion intelligent races out there. 
So when the Bible says that we shall rule as kings and priests with Christ, it's, it's, it's not toothless, it's not without substance. That is what God is exalting us to, us fallen human beings who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to sit with him on thrones. Wow. So we should take seriously our responsibilities here on earth because it is equipping us for greater, much greater responsibilities in heaven. All of a sudden, the promise that the redeemed will sit on thrones becomes significant. So we look forward to heaven. The pleasures of heaven, fruit from the tree of life, mansions of glory that Christ is building for us in the new Jerusalem. Isaiah describes that we will build our own houses, so we'll have city homes and country homes, that we, country homes we build ourselves. Traveling the world and the universe, fellowship with saints and angels and other heavenly beings, unfading youth and health. These are all things we should could and should look forward to in heaven. But Paul tells us what the hope of glory really is. We can see in uh, Colossians chapter 2, and I'm going to turn there because I can't read my, the screen there. So Colossians 2 verse 27, our scripture reading. I'm reading from the King James. Paul says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everything else I've mentioned and far more that we can't even imagine is just icing on the cake because the hope of glory is that Christ would come and dwell in our hearts and transform our hearts to, to reflect his perfect character. Christ in you, that is the hope of glory. That is what we look forward to. And we, we see that God does this through the Holy Spirit. We find in John chapter 14, um, on that last night with his disciples before his Betrayal, crucifixion, and death. Jesus tells us in John 14, verse 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. God wants to dwell in us. He goes on to say in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. We think about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We think about Christ in our hearts. But folks, do you realize that God's intent is that the, the, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come through the Holy Spirit and take up residence in your heart as someone to live from within. The, the, God, the, the God who stretched out the heavens wants to dwell in your heart. You know, you can go outside on a, on a night like this, and when you, maybe not so easy in Saskatoon, but if you know it's a clear night, go out into the country and look at the Milky Way and just behold the glories of just our island in the universe. And just think about the fact that the God who stretched all that out with a word who the Bible says he holds all this in the palm of his hands, wants to dwell in your heart. Wow. Wow. It is amazing through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that God would want to do that. He wants to dwell in us. And that is what heaven is really all about. That is the, the essence. That is the heart of of heaven, we find in John chapter 
17, in Jesus' prayer, he says in verse 3, and this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is about knowing God. Everything else is just icing on the cake. So if we understand that, and we understand that God wants to come take up residence in our heart now, can we have eternal life today? Can you begin the experience of eternal life today? Yes. Absolutely, yes. God can give us his joy, his peace. He can give us the love, his love, that he is love dwelling in our hearts. I remember the day in college, a couple of years after I had given my heart to Christ and been baptized, I was sitting on the floor with my Bible on my couch one morning, reading the Bible, just spending my time in prayer and study, and I just remember kind of sitting back and soaking in the moment and realizing, I found it. I have found the meaning of life. Christ has come into my heart and he has filled that void and, and it was just such a, a feeling of satisfaction. God is there. Thank you, God. This is what life is about. Knowing God, sharing that with others. Realizing that I had been trying in the years leading up to college to fill that void through various means and nothing worked. I didn't realize what I was doing but I was asking things and people to fill that hole that only Christ could fill. But now here I'm sitting in college and Christ has come and filled that hole. Oh, wow, this is what I've been looking for. What a profound moment to me. That is what eternal life is about. It can start today. And that is why Jesus gives one of the most moving appeals in all of Scripture to the last day church, to Laodicea, when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him or dine with him and he with me. God invites, he, he's knocking, but we have to invite him in. And when you just look at this, this passage, you realize he's knocking on the door of our hearts. And that's actually an ongoing process because some of us, we have let Christ into our hearts, into our lives, in, into the, the house of our heart. But we might have said, well, you, you can come in, you can sit with me in the dining room, you can eat with me, but you can't go into that room or into that closet. And Christ is going to come to that door and he's going to knock on it. Say, I've got greater things for you, but you need to open this door. Will you let me into there too? So it's a continual process, letting Christ into every avenue and every part of our hearts. And as we think about uh, communion, what we do in these symbols that God himself has given us is we eat the bread, we drink this grape juice, this wine, we take it in. It is one of the many symbols that are wrapped up in this, in this uh, ceremony that Jesus himself has given us is that we are to take him in. We are to, to let Jesus in. Because Jesus, as a friend of mine used to tell me, Jesus didn't come so much to take us out of hell as he did to come take the hell out of us. Jesus didn't come so much as to take us to heaven as he did to take heaven and bring it into us, into our hearts. Everything else is icing on the cake. The hope of glory is that Jesus would dwell in our hearts and change our hearts. The question is, will we let him in? Will you let him into every area of your life? That is the appeal he is, 
he is giving as he knocks on the doors of our heart. And it's up to us to say, God, come in. So we are about to, to uh, I'll close with prayer here. We're about to go downstairs for our foot washing. You are welcome to join us. If you've never seen this before, it's new to you, you're welcome to come and watch or participate. Um, I believe the, the, get this right, I believe the women will be in the dining hall. And I believe the men will be in the division rooms. And the, there will be couples in the youth room. I believe that's how it is. Uh, if I'm wrong, just pay attention to what's going on there. And follow where every people's going. What's that? I'm good? Okay, all right. So let us close in prayer. Father,